all. Um, very much appreciate you guys all joining us today. We have a, a we very much appreciate the, the following. And uh, as many of you, some of you are new here. And so what we're doing is we're trying to put out a weekly and going forward, you'll see that it will be a bi-weekly um, webinar where we just go over the issues as related to COVID-19 and uh, issues for us being self-employed, issues for real estate professionals, issues for real estate investors. Uh, and uh, we're, we're trying to keep our finger on the, this thing. We're bringing in professionals every week that can help speak to one or more of the topics. Uh, hot topics today being, uh, again, the as always, the payroll protection program, uh, at least maybe one good final update on that for two weeks. And we also, have, I believe we have Rich Vetstein um, Jared, Matt, or Brianna, is he on? Have you guys found him? No, he has had a, uh, emergency appointment today and is not going to be able to join us today. Yep. Oh, well then there it Nothing is. Nothing COVID related. Okay. Hey. Nothing COVID related. We'll, Nothing, we'll... COVID related. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing COVID related. Even better. Um, that's fine. So we'll probably get him on. If it's not next week, then we'll do it in the, in the biweekly, but just wanted to thank you all for joining us once again. And I'm going to turn this over um, to, uh, to Jared or Matt to start us off with the program today. Thank you all so much. Awesome. So I will, uh, I'm going to go ahead and take it from here. Um, for those of you who joined us um, on the call last week, uh, you heard us talk a lot about where we kind of are in the real estate cycle and how 2008 is nothing like where we are now. And I should say how, where we are now is nothing like 2008 and how the real estate market is uh, continually going in upward direction. And I thought today would be a good opportunity to go ahead and kind of share where we are in terms of where consumer, sentiment, consumer sentiments are and what people are in line of thinking. Um, so there was a recent poll that we had conducted uh, and I wanted to share with you uh, not only some of the results from that poll, um, as well as kind of give you some more data uh, and talk about where we are in terms of our collective thought process as a consumer, as a customer, uh, and as basically people who are going to be taking up uh, things. And, and better, more importantly, better yet, how we can be positioning ourselves in terms of our thought process for where we need to be and what actions we need to be taking um, moving forward. And of course, this is coming at it from the perspective of trying to give you guys the best information so you can best position yourselves moving forward. So how are your actions? Where are we took, where are we, uh, where are we in terms of where we are at this point in time? There is good news starting to show. For those of you folks who are joining us from the great state of New Hampshire, you are in phase three today of reopening of the state. There are some more things that are opening back up. There are things that are starting to see signs of life yet again. Um, however, if you are joining us from the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we are still in the phase of everything still in a uh, shut down unless you are an avid golfer like myself and we're finally able to get back out on the golf course this weekend um, Things are still at a relative standstill and look like they're going to be at a relative standstill for at least a couple of weeks more However, there is good news on the horizon things are starting to open back up as we said last week The real estate market is still holding very firm. The numbers are starting to show out promising signs for where we are Demand has stayed where they are as we shared with you guys last week, and of course, if you did not join us last week, the uh, video um, of that presentation is available. If you go on our Facebook page, you can certainly have access to it there. Inventories are still at an all-time low. Demand is steady. Mortgages are harder to get, and rental demand is shrinking as rental prices continue to rise. This is not the 08 housing crisis. Things are in good shape. The overall economy is sound. There are a couple of indicators that we'll touch on in a second, but the overall economy is still holding out at a relatively good pace. Continue to take positive action as we keep saying time and time again. Do not allow for negativity to seep into your mindset. Allow yourself to remain positive. Allow yourself to be surrounded by the best information possible and continue to make informed decisions as, informed decisions as best you can. But it is important to start thinking about what is going to look like when things get back to a new normal. And yes, it is going to be a new normal. This has to entail and this has to feel like something different. This is going to think about things in a new light. 
it has to envision a new normal and what does it look like? How and what do businesses look like? How will businesses feel? How are businesses going to operate? And where and when are the consumer and customer's attention focused and all other things regarding their mindset? Where is their attention going to be? We are at the dawning of a new age. If you don't feel that way, look at what uh, um, um, sporting events have looked like as they started to be opened up. For those of you who are unaware, the very first United States based sporting event was held this weekend. It was a UFC fight. It was held down in Florida. There was nobody in the stands. It was a pay-per-view fight. It went off without a hitch, but there were no fans in attendance. That's looking like it's going to be what the new normal is. For those of you who have been following, the NBA is talking about continuing its season starting in June with no fans in attendance in either Las Vegas or somewhere down in Florida. That's what it's looking like it's going to be. Baseball's talking about the new thing in terms of playing its games in some sort of closed community. But those are really what we're looking at. That's the new normal. Customers and consumers and businesses are starting to open up, but it's conducted in a way that we have not ever been able to potentially even envision. In New Hampshire, hairdressers and salons were able to open up for the first time today. But you have to make an appointment and they will call you when they are ready for you. It's not like you can just show up anymore and just expect these things to happen. Restaurants are starting to open back up, but it looks very different where you're sitting far apart from people and you aren't just able to share a table anymore. Things are starting to look different. Things are going to feel different. But we have to understand that that is what new, new normal, at least for the foreseeable future, is. And we have to have a healthy appreciation for it. But we also have to have a healthy appreciation for where we are and what position we are in right now. So let's talk about what's happened in the last week. Four weeks, we've lost 22 million or 22 million people have filed for unemployment. 5.2 million people lost their jobs within the last week. 700,000 jobs were lost in March. That ended a streak of 113 consecutive months where there was job increases. Unemployment had been near 50 year lows with nearly full unemployment. We touched on these numbers last week. Now think about how much all that can change in one month. Think about where we are now compared to where we were at this point in time in February or the beginning of March and think how quickly things changed on a dime. That's how quickly these things are gonna be happening. This is the new normal. Things are gonna be changing week over week, month over month, day over day, and we have to be willing to ebb and flow with that as they come. That's not to say that we have to allow this negative energy to fill into us and we have to pay close attention and understand those numbers. We have to give those numbers credence. We have to give those numbers the respect that they're due. This is a national crisis in terms of job employment. There are a lot of people who are just taking job unemployment right now because they don't know where else to go. And they're willing to go ahead and take the unemployment because quite frankly, they think it's the best thing they could possibly do for them. I'm not here to judge those folks. But there are a lot of folks who've seen their hours cut back and who have been told to go file for unemployment because it's the best thing that their employer can tell them to do right now. That's the new normal. Things will change. These numbers will get better. Job increases will come back around. But take a look at this scale and take a look at this graph. This is from the last really 12 years going back to 2008. You'll see there, there are two dates in particular that are highlighted. March 28, 2009, that's considered the height of the last crisis, the last recession that we had coming off of 08, 09. That's considered the peak. The last real recession that we had was back in 2012. It was by no means the length of the 08, 09 crisis, but it was still considered a recession nonetheless because we had negative growth at that point in time. But quite frankly, we are nowhere near the level that we've been in the last 10 years. If you take a look at the unemployment spike and you'll see the claims month over month, week over week, you'll see that they've been relatively steady and relatively secure. And now all of a sudden, if you look at the last month and look at the last four weeks, you have, will have seen the inverse or mirrored L as they call it. That's not a scale that we wanna see, nor is that a graph that we wanna see moving forward. Those things will change, things will get better. And we have to give credence to where we are in the position that we are in on a week-to-week -week basis. But even in the dark of night, there is still starlight. 
take a look at this. This graph shows two things and two things I wanna pay close attention to. And this is done by the Pew Research Center where all these numbers and statistics and graphs that I'm gonna share with you come from. These are the major, last two major recessions that we've had, 2001 at the end of the dot-com bubble and 2008 at the last housing crisis that we've had. These graphs show negative economic sentiment and negative economic conditions. As you'll see, in 2011, 8% of Americans believe that economic conditions were good or excellent or good. Let's put it that way. In 2001, 37% of people believed that there were negative or there were good or positive economic signs to stand for. Take that in consideration. 8% of people in the last housing crisis believed that the economic conditions that existed in this country were excellent or good. And that's when the, that was the truly the darkest of the dark. At this point in time, 23% of Americans believe that the national economic conditions are still excellent or good. Take that in consideration for a moment. We are in perhaps the worst job crisis of the last 10 years. Job crisis where more people are unemployed than ever before. And that's across all spectrums. But yet there are still people who believe that we are in a good shape, that we are in good position and things will get better and things will get better. Take it back to even 01 in the March of 2001, the, last, the second last recession that we had that lasted for any significant period of time. And 37% of people believe that economic conditions were excellent or good. So here's where you are. Enthusiasm is common. If you are the minority right now, you will see that there is nearly a two to one belief that the economic conditions will be better in a year from now compared to where they are and where they are right now. That's men believing it'll be 60%, women at a 51% clip. That's a two to one, nearly two to one sentiment, believing it'll be better than worse and about the same believing it will be consistent. So pay what you want to the attention that the media and the news is wanting to give this and paint the bleak picture. Yes, there are signs that are bleak. Yes, there is bad news and attention does need to be paid to that. But it is not a bury your head in the sand kind of moment and scream that the sky is falling. Yes, it will be hard in the interim. Yes, it'll be bad in the interim, but there will be pain now, but there will be growth later. As a society, we are conditioned to believe that sacrifice now will pay off later. And to have a healthy concern is certainly natural. To want to take action is natural. And to believe that things will look different is all natural. And to believe that things changing is natural. But we all have to act accordingly. I think from the Jack Nicholson line, the movie The Departed, where Jack Nicholson plays a South Boston mafioso, uh, and he's at a scene at a local diner, and he's talking to one of the patrons and one of his fellow mobsters, and he's acting how things are, and the guy basically shares with him that things aren't great and things could be going better, and Nicholson's reply as the um, um, character says, we all are, things are all bad, we all have to act accordingly. That's the condition that we are in. It is better to believe and understand where we are now to position yourself and put yourself in the best position you possibly can to act accordingly and to act in the manner that you see fit. That might be different for every single one of us on this call, but it is better to be taking action than take no action at all. Here's one of the first questions I wanna share with you after this research that Pew Research Center did and they did this survey at the very end of March. Uh, and just release these results um, at the beginning of the month. Overall, to what extent are you concerned about the health-related consequences of the coronavirus situation? Nearly almost every single person said to some extent they are worried. Only 1.65% of people said that they had a very large or very small concern to the degree. That's accurate. Give it credence, it's a serious crisis. It is a serious pandemic. This isn't something that needs to not be given credit, but to believe that you're in the minority where you aren't giving credence to it is actually wrong. It is all right to feel concerned. To be concerned is not the minority opinion. In fact, it is the overwhelming majority of, of opinion. It is all right to be concerned. What isn't all right is to think that it is going to be um, a negative economic concern to it. Again, 
The majority of people believe that, again, with this question, overall, to what extent are you concerned about the economic related consequences of the coronavirus situation? Again, 31.33% of people said they are to an extremely large content concerned. To a very large consent extent, 30, 25% of people. To a large extent, 23%. Less than 1% of people believe that the coronavirus uh, economic concern uh, is to a small extent. Consider that. So let's talk about that. Again, overwhelming majority of opinion are concerned about it, but it is now time to take action and cease action to be concerned and lean forward in a positive energy. These show to what steps people have taken. Uh, and for those of you who, again, we will be sharing all this with you, so don't feel like you need to absorb all this or try to you know, pause this to, to get a grasp of it. But there are different actions that we can be taking. Majority, hey, how are you doing? Majority, hey, you doing? majority of people. I'm Monday trying to fight or for questions. <laughs> hey, Jared, can you mute yourself? I hopefully will be too, but as a customer, you can mute, you have to mute him, Matt. Hang on, Jared. Uh, I got to get back into it here. This is awkward. Yeah. <laughs> I'm back. Why can I get back into it? No, I'm stopping you. There we I'm go. A lot of companies have been moving. I can, I can mute him. Go. I can mute him. Got him. We're good. Price is averted. Uh, we'll go back to the screen share, back there. There we go. Present, and we're back into it. And we're back. Um, as I was saying, people are taking actions here. They're working more remotely from home. They're avoiding going to physical stores. They're quarantining in their, uh, in their place of their homes. They're practicing social distancing. They're disinfecting hard surfaces. I think this is hilarious. They're avoiding touching your face. Take a look at that number. 25.68% of people saying they are doing it to a larger extent than they previously had. How you exactly can track that number, I don't know. And God bless those people who are actively taking track of how many times they're touching their face over a period of a day or so. I honestly, if you want to try a really hard exercise, count from in for the next 15 minutes over the course of this presentation or over the time that we're with you here this afternoon, how many times you touch your face. You'll be horribly mortified at the number of times that you've done it. And you've probably done it at least once or twice in the amount of time that I've been talking about this. But people are taking active steps. And it's not to say that you um, are doing anything less or more, but there is a large extent of people um, who are taking active steps. For us, my wife and I, with our son, we decided to quarantine in our home. We're down in our place on Cape Cod. We just decided that it was time that we actively just shelter in place, for lack of a better term. We're trying to go out as, as few as we can. Uh, we're doing a lot of deliveries to our home for groceries. And of course, we're working remotely. Things like this, this is maybe what the new normal looks like. Less trips to the grocery store. You're starting to hear now places in terms of food being rationed out. That's not to say that it's not done to strike fear into the harms of people. It's meant and done to keep active steps moving forward so things can happen in a more progressive fashion and things can happen at a better rate than they were if action wasn't taken. So pay attention to those numbers. A lot of you have seen these graphs before. Here's where I wanna bring attention to. And in, in particular, uh, being evicted from your home, needing to declare personal bankruptcy or having a recession, an economic recession in the United States. Pay attention to what those numbers are. 69% of people, almost 70% of people to an extremely small extent are concerned about being evicted from their home or having their car repossessed uh, or vehicle repossessed is 75% of the folks that believe that that's not gonna happen. Think about where we were in 2008 and 2009 where the overwhelming majority of folks in America were concerned about losing their home. I believe the number was something in the 60s that people believe that their home was going to be repossessed or that they were going to have, um, they were gonna be evicted from their home or have to declare some sort of bankruptcy to wipe their debt away. This is not the case. 
People are more positive. People have a better sense of where they are. There are a lot of people who aren't even concerned about losing their job. If you take a look at that first one, 52.68% to an extremely small extent believed they were going to be losing their job. People are taking action to make sure that they don't lose their job, whether they're agreeing to be furloughed for a couple of months, taking pay, increase, pay decreases, salary freezes. Action is being taken for the good of the overall whole. And that's where we are. This is what matters between now and where we were years ago in 08 and 01. Lessons have been learned in recessions. Lessons have been learned about where we are and what could be done differently. And the economics facts are bearing out and where people are and what people are thinking. If you look at the very bottom, that actually tells the biggest story. Personally suffering economic loss, lost wages or investment losses. And you'll see that the largest pool there at 20.83% have actually seen some sort of large extent loss, whether it be wages or investments. Now, of course, the stock market took a huge hit at the beginning of this period of time. But over the course of the last couple of months, more people have come out and said that they've, freezing, they've frozen their wages or they've taken a salary hit in order to keep their job and maintain their job so that their business, in particular small businesses, can stay open. But less people are being worried about being evicted from their home. Let's fast forward now to this particular graph. People likely refinancing their home has decreased to a large extent, 12.2% and increased at a 55.75% with 2.2% of people staying the same. Now there's, I'll show you a second, there's, uh, of course that people are looking at that, that's not going up to adding to 100%. The line graph on this one uh, didn't translate very well over to the PowerPoint presentation. I will show you that in a second, but there's two things I wanna take and this particular slide is the meat of what I wanted to talk about today. If there are 55.75% of people who are increasing their thought of refinancing their home, what does that mean? Well, we shared with you last week that there have been less people pulling out less equity from their home than the last housing crisis. But now people are realizing that maybe that is a strong indication of what they should be doing. So indicators would have you believe if this is what's called a lagging indicator, that that would mean that we are potentially setting ourselves up for a housing crunch, maybe in three to five to seven years from now, as people start to worry if they pull their capital out of their house now, what things will look at like in five to seven years from now when their rates start to change. And if they've lost their job now, how hard or easy will it be to pull that equity out of their home? And are they setting themselves up for a financial hurt in years from now? To me, that is actually the most important number that we can potentially look at. And the reason why I wanted to pull it out of the line back and really pay close attention to it at this point in time. Take a look at the graph right below that. People likely to sell their home, decrease to a large extent, 24.2%, increase to a large extent, 64.2%, and likely to stay the same, 11.6%. This is clear cut and dry. That actually adds up to 100%. Nobody's taking a stance of, I'm thinking about selling my house, but I'm not going to do it anymore. Or they're saying, yes, I 100% want to sell my house. There's no cut and dry thing in the middle. If you've heard me talk at any event before, you've heard me say time and time again, nobody wakes up on a Friday and says, today is a good day to sell my house. I need to sell my house today. Very few people wake up saying that. However, consumer sentiment and mindset of folks in the economy right now have had that trend saying that, yes, I am likely to sell my house. More than likely, that's 64%. There's a large segment of that population who were looking to sell their house in a strong spring market that never materialized. That started to show signs back in January, as we shared with you last week, that we were potentially in for one of the more robust spring markets that we've had in the last decade, but that never had the chance to materialize because at the beginning of March, COVID-19 hit and everything went downward. The housing market took a kind of a halt. Everybody took a pause, everybody took a breath. There are a lot of people who are still looking to sell their house, but don't have the data in front of them to know what to do, or more importantly, how to do it. 
There are things out there that need to be done and we need to be taking the steps to talk to people and say that there are still options in front of you and you still have available means and available options and how best to go about handling the selling of your house. There is demand across the board for houses. There is low inventories right now and things can be done. We just have to be willing to take the actions to do it. And now is the time to take actions to do it. Here is the graph that I tried to share with um, before, as you can see, not all that pretty. Uh, you can take a look at it, refinancing your mortgage, re uh, remodeling or refurnishing your home. Um, a lot of people holding serve on that. Um, and I think that's more to do with they spend a lot more time in their home and realizing that they need to do some work to their home or they've looked at their living room and realized how outdated it is, or maybe they're thinking about putting new rugs, couches, TVs, whatever the case may be, there will be a large opportunity for people to redo a lot of these things. Consumers and customers want guidance. We are in a position to help educate and be a source of guidance for that. Know how to position yourself to become that source. Be willing to do the activities that you need to do to set yourself up for success remain positive to put the work in and continue to maintain a positive outlook on all things and seek out information and understand what it means. It's one thing just to be seeking out the information. It's a whole other thing altogether to seek the information out and have a better understanding for what exactly it means. Where can you seek out that information? One of the sources is with us at Black Diamond. Mark your calendars, Tuesday, May the 15th. We are going to be doing a Black Diamond virtual meetup, blackdiamondrei.com to register. Uh, go ahead and do that May the 15th. We're probably going to have Rich Vetskin on then as he wasn't able to join us um, at this point in time, or we're going to have him uh, two weeks from today. Uh, our next webinar is going to be May the 25th, 3 p.m. As they used to say, same bat time, same bat place. Uh, be sure to register on the link to get the access to that. We are gonna start moving into every two weeks unless there is some sort of newsworthy, newsworthy event or information that we deem important enough to know, for you to know, to position yourselves in the best positive light, in the best positive way. We are going to position you as best we can. So unless there's nothing new coming out that is uh, changing the way in terms of all the CARES Act and all the different acts and stuff like that, uh, we are gonna be talking to you next um, Monday the 25th at 3 p.m as well. And of course, if you want to connect with us, you certainly can do so. There's how you can do it. Uh, AA Real Estate Mentor, AA Real Estate Group, and join our meetup group, Info Base, Fix and Flip, Boston Rehab, or Wholesaler Network. So you can be sure to keep up with all the things that you need to know in the case that there is something that comes out in the next two weeks that we want. As, uh, hey, Matt, just to, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, while you're doing your wrap up, and because we are, you know, we don't have Rich today, yep. we have some extra time. And I'm wondering, if there's anyone here, any people who are on these meetings uh, specifically that want to have any sort of questions or discussions brought up um, that they want to discuss today. So while you know Matt's doing his wrap up, uh, if you guys want to you just type in the chat box and we can kind of bring you on, um, make you live. If we just want to chat about whether it's real estate related, self-employment related. Um, I also, I, I should have probably asked this too. Is it Anthony and Ron, are they there to- I don't see them yet. I just looked, I did not see them yet. Okay. But it is All just, right, so while, yeah, you should be here momentarily though. While we're waiting for them anyway, does anyone have anything that they would like to bring up specifically on how this is impacting their business, on what they, you know, what they are doing specifically to prepare for um, the new normal, uh, for how they're bettering themselves, uh, or just if, how are you feeling? If there's ways that we can all kind of work together as a group, all of us here together. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll let people start to post in the, in, the, in the box. And Jared, if you are available to help moderate a bit, uh, I'm still walking, I have contractors in here and a dog just escaped and I have lots of issues. So I'm, I'm going on a mute let me, let again. Me take, let me take the first question here. Uh, language allowed in MA for rent notice for non-payment. Can we get a little bit of, can I get a little bit of a clarification as to what you mean on that? If you're talking about trying to go after somebody who hasn't paid the rent, um, there are some very, very strict guidelines and regulations in place you want to be extra careful on. So if we can get a little clarification on what you're looking and what you're talking about, and that way we can, I can best give you some guidance uh, on what we're talking about and what we're faced with at that point in time and where we are at that, uh, from that standpoint. 
I bring that if they're available, bring them on. Uh, just bring them on so they can get a new fresh face and okay. hear some other perspectives. Bear with me one second. I've got to go find these people. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I click participants and then do a search for the name yeah. at the top. Oh, even clear that. Okay, Susan, I'm unmuting you. So if you want to just go ahead and share with your question, just speak right to it if you'd like. Don't be shy. You're unmuted. Go ahead. Go ahead, Susan. Okay. So if you like, or if you feel more comfortable, just putting in the chat box. And I understand that people say the 15th is um, Tuesday. Yes, Tuesday, May the 15th is Black Diamond. Uh, our next meeting is going to be the 25th. So there's two different meetings there. There's Black Diamond, which is going to be, um, I guess I'm wrong. Uh, Jared, can you unmute yourself and share the Black Diamond day there? Because I, I guess I did have that wrong. And Susan, we did just unmute you. Uh, she said she was saying that there's a technical issue. But Susan, are you available too? Oh, all right. Jared, I'm unmuting you here. So uh, one oh, black diamond. Oh, it's, oh my gosh. It's... He keeps muting himself. Okay. We will get those. We will get those. Correct dates. Um, so, so I guess your question, Susan, is about allowable, um, go back to your question, allowable language for non-payment for tenants. The long and short of it, folks, and this is actually a good question to ask, um, the long and short of it, folks, is it's, I, this is going to sound terrible, um, but truth of the matter, you're better off not saying anything. And it, it pains me to say that. Um, and I didn't believe we would ever be in a position um, to say that, but the current legislation and current regulations and rules in place is if somebody is not paying, it is best just to hold serve and hold court until things open back up and you are allowed to take action. Uh, there are a lot of landlords right now who have put themselves in hot water legally because they've gone after a tenant for non-payment of rent within the last two months. Um, here in the state of Mass or the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the governor has come down and, and come right out and said, there's nothing you can really do as a landlord. Uh, for those of you who have been paying close attention in the uh, relief acts of different things, they're potentially putting into the next um, legislation for relief act, relief for landlords um, who have been um, affected negatively by people not paying rent. Uh, and it's going to be interesting to see how that bears out. Um, and yes, there are um, kind of understanding of what you can and can't do. Um, but Rich had actually shared with us, um, I believe it was two weeks ago, um, on one of our calls uh, with the Black Diamond Group, um, that this is one of the things that he is looking to fight. Um, and there is a various language that you can share um, in how to do it. And he is taking up that fight uh, to the courts here in the Commonwealth. Um, so things are constantly changing. But right now, in the current position that you are in as a landlord, it is best just to kind of hold serve and let things um, settle um, to to go ahead and do it. Each state is different. Each state has had different guidelines and expectations on what you can and can't do. Um, so it is just best just to kind of hold serve um, and allow things to exist uh, in the current landscape in the current state of mind. And just to jump in there, I think that was what Rich was gonna address. So I think yeah. that is kind of what we'll be going over at the next meeting. Cause I, I had put that in the description um, the yeah. question she was asking, because that was what Rich had said he was going to go over. So 
I'm sure that'll be addressed at the, the next Black Diamond meeting or the next um, webinar here. Uh, Jared, since I do see you back on, can you share with us the correct date for the next Black Diamond since there seems to be some concern about that? The next date for Black Diamond is going to be 519. So Tuesday, 519. Tuesday the, Tuesday the 19th. So I was right, it was Tuesday, it's just the 19th and not the 15th. I apologize for that. Yep. Uh, anybody else have any other questions before we uh, open the floor up to uh, Ron uh, and Anthony, who I see have joined us? All right, Anthony, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you uh, as I search for Ron here. Good to see you again. Good to see you guys. How's everyone doing? Um, I kind of want to get right into it uh, and ask you, there's been a lot of speculation out there, um, in particular this last week, about where we are with um, the PPP plan and the EIBDL running out of money again, and people have all but stopped. What are you hearing on that side of things and what's the guidance that you're giving to um, your folks right now? Uh, I, I haven't heard about um, any funds running dry from, from the, the last time I checked. Um, there's still some funds of it. There's still more than enough funds available and um, it's recommended to try to go through smaller banks at this point um, just to get money as quick as you can. Um, I have, I have heard that the, the, the idle loans, the EIDLs, um, those are starting to roll out for uh, a few clients that got funded last week. So those are slowly but surely um, at this point. But uh, from a PPP loan standpoint, there's still money available. Um, I haven't heard of, uh, of those funds running dry yet. It's just recommended to, um, if you haven't applied and you're thinking about applying um, to do so. And obviously if you're application is stagnant, um, it's recommended to follow up and um, as we mentioned uh, in our last meeting, um, try to evaluate as many banks as you can. Uh, and, and like I said, sometimes the, the smaller banks uh, may be the better way to go at this point. Yeah, so uh, I've heard that there's about 120 billion left in the PPP. Um, I think I heard that actually as of this morning. So, um, but that doesn't mean like, there's still a lot of applications in the queue. So there's still a lot of people still sending in those applications that banks were, some of the larger banks were limited to how many applications that they could send to the SBA at a time. So um, again, it's still, get, if you haven't got your application in, get it in as soon as possible uh, because there, there's still an opportunity to get that money. But again, it's still going to go quick and we're finding that, um, the SBA is being a lot more stringent on, on who they're giving money to. So they're definitely checking to make sure that publicly traded companies like the, the Los Angeles Lakers aren't getting their, their hands on, on, on these anymore. One of the questions I, I wanted to pose to you guys is, uh, and we've seen it the last couple of weeks in particular with the unemployment numbers, for the people who have thought about going on unemployment but have been approved for the PPP loan, I think you touched on this a couple of weeks ago. Um, but I just want to circle back to it because the numbers are just staggering on that. Once you've applied for unemployment, but have received your PPP loan, what are you to do and what action steps are you required to then do? If you're in receipt of the PPP loan and you have received funding and you have that money, you're no longer unemployed. That, that's what you need to keep in mind. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a timing, um, a timing play where you want to have, the unemployment benefits up until the point that um, you have the PPP funding, but as soon as you have that funding, you're no longer unemployed. Um, so you need to communicate that with the state. Um, I mean, thankfully, the PPP loan gives you a, a little bit of a heads up in the sense that you'll get an email with some um, ahead of time to let you know you've been approved and you know the closing documents are coming before you'll need to um, before you actually receive the funds. So that gives you a little bit of time to notify the state. Um, but there is there is a timing play there where when you do have that Paycheck Protection Program money, you're no longer unemployed. So you, you just wanna be careful that you're not double dipping, quote unquote, um, by receiving the unemployment and getting the funding of the loan. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. 
for one thing I'll, I'll add to that is for, for people in here who have employees, again, part of what we talked about a little bit last week is if you offer the employee the job back and they say no, um, at that point, there's going to be some sort of notification with the, the state let them know that the, the individual has refused employment and then they should not be able to collect uh, unemployment if um, they were offered a job. Mm -hmm. What is the best line of, um, that you guys have seen or the best guidance that you've given to people when talking about, as you just mentioned, giving people back the jobs or giving hiring people back or whatever the case may be um, to document? that rehiring process or that it's somebody new that you rehired or that you brought back on? I think if you have the manpower and the, the resources, um, I would recommend doing it by mail um, just so you have something uh, you know, on paper and documented. Um, a phone conversation might not be the best route. I would say by email or, um, or by you know, snail mail there um, to send them a notice just to let them know that um, you, know, you can dress it up however you deem fit, but essentially um, you're ready to offer them, you know, full or close to full-time employment back. Um, it, they, they have the option to, um, to come back, but um, they need to let you know, you know, quick turnaround. Um, and then from there, um, you ask to be notified of their decision so you can document it um, because it's important. The documentation as with, you know, most of, mostly everything with this loan that we're coming to find out is extremely important. So you just want to have on record um, that, that you did good faith offer their position back. And if they turned it down, it's going to be important for two reasons. You know, one, um, so they stop receiving benefits with the state because they're no longer unemployed if you offered them their full-time job back. Um, and then two, it's important to document it for the full-time employee calculation um, as part of the forgiveness. Um, so there's, two reasons that you want to have that um, documented. Okay. Um, I'm going to go into the chat box here. If anybody has questions they'd like to ask uh, Ron or Anthony about all things PPP or the CARES Act, by all means, this is the time to get them in. The first question that we've gotten is, what is the likelihood that businesses will get audited regarding their use of the PPP loan? Um, and potentially what would that entail in terms of potential cost, if you can just ballpark that? Yeah, so with, it, it's tough to say uh, if this PPP loan's just going, I, I actually just had the question before we were on this, if I inadvertently got PPP money that I shouldn't have, am I now going to get audited? Um, if I've um, received PPP money that, um, I don't use for proper expenditures. Is that going to get audited? Again, I don't see an IRS audit changing here based on the PPP where you're really going to get scrutinized. And what Anthony was alluding to is a documentation from the bank on the forgiveness piece. Um, that's going to be pretty key um, to make sure that you are using the money for qualified expenditures to get it forgiven. But as far as the likelihood of an audit, I don't think it's going to be any more likely than any other regular audit. There's nothing here that's going to raise a red flag if you use it properly. Um, where you can see a red flag is, um, let's say you had an S corporation that um, received PPP money, but they don't have any payroll on there. I guess you could see some sort of red flag in that situation, but um, for the most part, um, I don't see the likelihood of an audit increasing just because of PPP money, because there's a lot of taxpayers out there who are utilizing the PPP loan and they just don't have the resources to audit everybody. Hmm. Is there any guidance that you can give to somebody in the event that they've gotten the PPP loan and they either shouldn't have, I mean, is there any action that you can give to somebody in that position where they, applied for it, realized they A, don't need it, or B, were given it when they shouldn't have been given it? Yeah, so there's, there's a couple of options here. One, you can repay it. I think you have up until May 14th to quote unquote repay it. Um, and, and, that's and that is interest free, correct? If you pay by the 14th, correct. Interest and penalty free. Um, there's a lot of taxpayers out there 
they, they put their application in with the bank. The bank didn't really know the rules when they were processing these applications. And they gave some people some money that they probably shouldn't have. Now, as far as a repayment goes, uh, I think they're going to look more to companies that probably took the money and they shouldn't have because they're, they're, do, they're doing just fine. There's a lot of people who took some money or maybe applied for some money and got some money who really still could use the money to, to get them through this period that you could make the argument that, hey, I want to get what I can for giving on this thing. If not, it's going to convert into a loan at 1% interest that I got to repay in the next two years. Um, obviously, our guidance would be, and it's just from a professional ethics standpoint, if you got something that you shouldn't have, you should definitely repay it back. Um, but there are a lot of taxpayers who have received um, some monies that maybe weren't accurate, um, but they still need that money to get through. And what they're telling us is, I understand your guidance, but I'm still going to keep it. And I'm going to take my 1% interest loan and I'll pay it back in two years and get what I can for giving. What would you say to the people out there uh, who are thinking, I don't have the use for the money now, but I got it. I'm going to hold on to it. I'm going to safeguard it until I absolutely really need it. Um, and if I have to pay the interest, I'm going to pay the interest. Yeah, um, so the, the, the issue that we have here is we don't have the loan forgiveness guidance yet. Um, from what we keep hearing from the Treasury, uh, we keep hearing this week, this week, this week. The latest I've heard is we're supposed to get it on – uh, May 14th on or before is what I, what I was told. So which would be, which would be Wednesday, Wednesday, which yep. that would help hopefully clarify that question a little bit to say, Hey, I received the money. Um, again, I can make it through these times and I don't really need to utilize this money, but come the fall where this thing might kind of linger in and I really could use the money then. Um, or just based on how my business is, it's a little bit cyclical where um, in the fall, I'm a little bit slower than I might be in the spring right now. I'm going to use the funds then. Again, there, there's nothing in the guidance that says you have to pay it back. But the, the, the guidance that we know right now is that if you don't spend the money within the first eight weeks, you can't get it forgiven. Awesome. Now, there is a bill in Congress right now that could substantiate, substantially change how the PPP program is, um, and it's actually gaining a lot of traction. I alluded, I alluded that in the presentation where they're adding in almost everything in the housing crisis as well. Exactly. Yeah. And, and part of it is, if, if people were on the call last week, we talked about um, the expenses that you utilize the funds for with non-deductible. In that bill, they're going to allow you to double dip and let it be deductible. So, um, again, it, that that's gaining some traction. Um, and it, but there, there's there's a fight in Congress right now between Democrats and Republicans on what the next bill will look like. Um, I think this part of the bill probably has a little bit of bipartisanship with it, but. The funding of state and local governments, the Republicans do not want to do, which the Democrats do. Um, so again, there's going to be a lot of give and take, um, and a lot of, a lot of Republicans right now are concerned about the, um, the deficit and okay. adding to it. So fascinating things to be watching on this week. Is there anything in particular that folks should be highlighted to pay close attention to this week on this front? You mentioned Wednesday, uh, as the announcement of when the regulation should be coming. Is there anything to pay close attention to? on Wednesday that people shouldn't just read the headlines, read the story and pay close attention to? So two things that I'm concerned about on Wednesday. One is how they are treating what they call a full-time equivalent. So if you're an employer and you have employees, part of the deal of this program is anybody you laid off, you're supposed to hire back the same amount of people. So what we don't know is what is considered a, a full-time employee calculation. We think we have some ideas, but we don't know. Um, so I'm on the lookout for that. The second thing I'm on the lookout for is um, if they're gonna change anything with the owner compensation replacement for sole proprietors. Um, right now, we think you're gonna get a max of $15,385 completely forgiven um, without really, um, 
much uh, pullback from the bank on that. Um, but I don't know. Um, I, I, I'm very curious if there's going to be anything in the, the loan forgiveness piece about the owner compensation replacement. And I don't know if you have anything to add of things that you're on the lookout for this week. Um, it's interesting. The, the owner's compensation replacement piece, um, pretty much, um, you know, just to circle back to that, that would be, you know, um, for anyone that, that hasn't been joining us, the owner compensation replacement is essentially the amount of the paycheck protection loan that um, in place of you being self-employed um, and not having employees, um, essentially you're going to get eight weeks out of 52, that percentage of your net profit um, forgiven almost for nothing. Um, just, you know, because the SBA understands that as a self-employed individual, that's your your income, that's what you take out of the business, that's what you live off of. So eight out of 52 weeks of your net profit is, um, you don't owe that back because that's just replacing the inflow of profit that you've lost um, in the place of the coronavirus. Um, I mean, a couple of things that I think were pretty radical um, that I'd be interested to see if anything comes out on is the fact that you're not eligible to take an expenditure um, for 2020 as a self-employed individual for forgiveness um, if you didn't have that expenditure in 2019. A um, couple of other things that are interesting is how are they going to treat um, the accrual versus the cash concept essentially you know for forgiveness purposes if you're a self-employed individual and you pay rent um, because the 8 out of 52 weeks is the equivalent of two months will they only let you deduct um, towards the forgiveness, two months of rent, or, you know, let's say, let's say you have three month uh, payments for three months rent in there, you know, the day that you received the funding, you paid rent for the, um, the month before, and then you incurred two other payments, will they let you deduct um, towards forgiveness those three payments, or because eight, eight weeks is the attributable of two months, will they only let you take two? Um, that's a, some questions I've been fielding this week. Um, so, uh, there's a few things that um, some of those, those, those details are, are, are very intriguing that I'll be looking out for. All right, so there'll be plenty of stuff that uh, to keep an, keep an eye out there for folks. We will try to maybe have something, just uh, a, a quick little video, maybe recapping if you guys would mind, we'll set something up with uh, either one of you two for next week. Maybe we can just do a very short video uh, highlighting what's been announced on Wednesday, uh, just to keep everybody informed. Maybe not necessarily a call like this, but just a short little video Q&A style um, with what people need to be aware of, just so we can keep everybody informed. Uh, what I want to do right now is um, Fred Mayer um, uh, offered to jump on real quick uh, and talk to the rental regulations on that. So Fred, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you right now. Um, I appreciate your, uh, you volunteering here to uh, jump on this uh, and speak to the questions here. Um, do you want to just kind of take the floor and go from there? Sure. There were some uh, emergency regulations uh, that were uh, promulgated about, that. and what I'm looking to address is the question that came up earlier regarding to what extent you can uh, give a tenant a notice regarding the rent payments uh, that they may be uh, may be missing. So, so what I linked in the, in, in the chat was 400 CMR 5.00, the COVID-19 emergency regulations. And if you go to those regulations uh, and you link, you, you click on them and it's a PDF, uh, you'll get to a section 5.03 obligation to pay rent notice of rent arrearage and a subparagraph two that in 5.03 uh, two, it states that they've got like three paragraphs that you need to include if you're thinking about sent delivering a, a, a notice of late rent uh, to, uh, to one of your, your tenants. And it starts in all capital letters this is not a notice to quit. You are not being evicted and you do not have to, uh, to leave, your, leave your home. I did have, this, uh, uh, did have this on my screen. Let me see if I... Uh, and for those of you who are following along, that link is in the chat. Uh, if you'd like to go ahead and, and pull it up yourself in the PDF, it is linked there in the chat. You can go ahead and do it. 
And, and what, I, what I think I'm going to do real, real quick is uh, see if I can share my screen. Uh, if we have the capability, I'll just pull the, uh, the regs themselves so, so that you, you can see what we're, we're, uh, we're, if we're, not, we're talking I, I can, about. If not, I can certainly do that too here, Fred. Okay. Uh, let me see. I think I've got. You can make him a co-host, Matt, if uh, he can't do it. I think I, I'm pulling them up right now, actually, and I still have the share going. So there. Perfect. There we are. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So uh, let me. So if you go to the second page. Yeah, there. There it and is. This is not a notice to quit. That's what I'm talking about. Exactly. So at the bottom of what is the printed page two, there you have that section. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, even though this is supposed to be some kind of standard form uh, that we are supposed to be using, uh, I, don't I don't think that the uh, EOHED has as yet uh, produced this particular form. Uh, so that's, that's what I wanted to add. That's, that's the language that you're gonna need on your, 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 uh, your, your form. Um, so I've just figured I'd, I'd, I'd throw that in. That's, that's really all I had to. Uh, as a as a as a lawyer, you see in your in the in the comments there, Fred, that you are a lawyer up in um, New Hampshire. Can you speak to what's happening in New Hampshire at all? Oh, I yes, I, I, actually, I can speak much better to what's happening in the, in in, uh, uh, in New Hampshire. I became involved in uh, Mass Landlords. Became a member of Mass Landlords uh, because my my volume of Massachusetts evictions is much much lower uh, than my New Hampshire ev evictions, um, and it, it uh, really enjoyed getting uh, some very practical feedback from, from uh, members of the organization and the speakers and the webinars. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been very helpful. Uh, in New Hampshire, uh, I, I do a lot of landlord-tenant work in various uh, counties throughout New Hampshire. Uh, we currently are under a state of emergency. Now, in New Hampshire's state of emergency, it works differently than the Massachusetts one. In New Hampshire, one of the things that uh, the governor has to do is he has to renew his uh, declaration of emergency every 21 days, as opposed to, as I understand it, with, with Governor Be Governor Baker, Baker has it easier. Once he's declared it, he, he simply has to undeclare it when, when he gets around to it. Yep. Uh, so quite frequently what happens up here is you'll have certain directives that appear to go beyond the state of emergency. So the next red letter date for us up here in New Hampshire is uh, the 15th, because the 15th is the date that the, uh, the uh, declaration of the state of emergency expires. Uh, I, I will not be shocked if it, he extends it uh, another 21 days and gets us in, into, uh, into June. The significance for, Matt, for New Hampshire landlords is that while the state of emergency exists, there are a couple of emergency orders uh, that for the most part prohibit uh, evictions, prohibits uh, initiating evictions, prohibits getting eviction orders, prohibits uh, service of uh, what up here are called writs of possession and down in Massachusetts you call uh, executions. Uh, significantly in, uh, in April, he, he, the governor uh, Sununu did make two major exceptions uh, to the, the, what was um, an absolute ban initially. And it is now possible for us to litigate litigate bans if, excuse me, litigate evictions if the uh, landlord uh, has uh, sustained substantial damage to the property as a result of the conduct of the tenant, or if the tenant is uh, engaging uh, in conduct that is uh, adverse to health or safety. So those two exceptions exist. And then with regard to the courts up here, Right now, uh, they are for the most part have suspended in-person hearings, uh, and that dramatically affects uh, you know, what up here would be a summary process action called a merits hearing on the on the eviction. For the most part, they're not happening. Although last week of April or thereabouts, the New Hampshire Supreme Court came down with a rule uh, that uh, basically tracked the governor's modification of his emergency orders. So now the court will treat landlord tenant uh, cases where substantial damage or conduct adverse to health or safety is involved. We'll, we'll treat those cases like an emergency case or a temporary case. 
and the landlords uh, can expect some kind of either uh, telephonic hearing uh, or, or some kind of proceeding to take place uh, before uh, the, uh, the, the courts theoretically open for business uh, on the 26th of, uh, 26th of May. So that's, that's the deal here. It's, 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 uh, it's a fresh guy constantly evolving round robin, so to speak. It, it, it is between, um, uh, one of the things I enjoyed about the, uh, enjoy is probably the wrong word, but one of the things I appreciated about the, uh, the seminar uh, done by Mass Landlords on the, on the Mass Moratorium and the, and the, and the CARES Act uh, it, is that uh, for, for someone like me who practices law on, on the border, I, I need to keep track of New Hampshire law, Massachusetts law, and now, of course, we have the federal government uh, weigh, weighing in with the, uh, with, with the CARES Act. And so I, I found the, the uh, presentation uh, from, uh, from, from the panelists very helpful with regard to both the mass moratorium uh, and, the, and also the, uh, uh, also the, the, federal, uh, the, the federal CARES Act. One major uh, impediment that we don't have up here in New Hampshire relates to collection actions. Um, I, I'm, I'm aware that uh, just last week, uh, collection agency uh, and some law firms were successful in enjoining the emergency regulations from uh, the Massachusetts Attorney General uh, that uh, uh, on the face of it, bans the initiation of collection suits and certain, um, certain telephone calls uh, into, into uh, folks who owe rent or other consumer debts. Uh, and those, uh, those regulations were enjoined as of, I think, last Friday, uh, but the case is, is still on, ongoing. We haven't experienced anything like that up here. So here in New Hampshire, uh, there's nothing unlawful or unethical of my calling uh, a, a tenant and, and saying, you know, you still owe the money, even though I can't evict you right now. And there's no impediment to my filing a, a, a small claim action uh, for past due rent uh, up here. So that's a, uh, a tool that normally I wouldn't rely upon uh, in representing landlords because eviction actions were so much more effective way to, to collect past due rent. But given that uh, I don't have that option right now, um, a couple of my, my tenants or a couple of my clients are going to uh, take a shot and see whether it makes a difference if they, they bring a small claim action, knowing that it will take you know, several months for the small claim action to resolve itself. There's, there's a message though, I think that we're trying to send um, in, in a number of different ways. And that is, this is not a period of free rent. Uh, it was most appreciative that the, the attorney general's office up here actually had that, that phrase uh, namely, this is not a period of free rent in some guidance issued by the Attorney General's office. And unfortunately, there's definitely a perception among some uh, tenants uh, that it, that it is or it should be. Yeah, I think, the, I think the guidance that people should be following on that is don't be knocking on the door of people of those who haven't paid their rent, but be open to dialogue and having a conversation yeah. more you, important you, than anything else. You hear that a lot. Uh, you want to be open to dialogue. You, you want to work with people. Uh, the, the, there's no pro prohibition of, uh, of, of, of against the landlord uh, conversing with the tenant yeah. uh, who reaches out with them. Uh, there are all ki kinds of different ways of dealing with things. Uh, the, uh, the CARES Act prevents you from charging late fees right, right now um, the, if you're a covered property. And, and I won't, I won't get into that right now, sure. but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the dia dialogue is important to send the message that if you make a payment now, we can work with you. Uh, and that means that over the long term, uh, instead of facing some, um, some massive uh, arrears uh, come you know, Labor Day, yeah. Uh, we can have a working relationship. You can stay as a tenant. I can stay as a landlord and I'll have some money to fix things. I think one of the biggest misconceptions about this whole CARES Act and things that have been put in place is that you're not meant to reach out in a negative light to a landlord or to a tenant saying, hey, you've missed a payment, you know, pay up, pay the piper, so to speak. Um, but I think it's and, and we've been doing this as a company here with our um, residents. 
is that we've been trying to have an open dialogue with them from the very get-go about their plans, about what's happening, and just keeping it a, an open dialogue and a two-way street going both ways. I, I caution that, particularly in Massachusetts, the, the language exactly you need, crucial. You got to be you got you got to be careful with your language. Yep. Uh, for example, in the mass moratorium statute, uh, you you can't have anything that you say uh, resemble a request to vacate. Uh, on the other hand, um, if uh, a tenant uh, contacts you and and says um, this is all that's coming in, or I'm not going to get my check until next week. Um, and, and you respond and say, well, what can you pay and when can you pay it? Uh, that, 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 that puts it in, in a, in a, in a different, uh, in a different light, uh, even, uh, under the regulations that have been enjoined. Uh, if somebody like me, uh, an attorney who sometimes collects debts for, for, for landlords, if I get a, 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 a an incoming call, that's fine. Yep. Uh, I can't make an outgoing call to, to the uh, to, to the in, in the individual, but it's a uh, it's a constantly uh, shifting la landscape as you've uh, you've noticed. Yep. Oh, I appreciate the insight on that, Fred. Thank you so much for sure. sharing uh, what's going on, on on both south of the border and north of the border there in New Hampshire. Um, does anybody else have any other questions um, before we wrap up things uh, here for today? We. We've been trying to keep these uh, to, to 90 minutes and we're coming up on that, um, that stop. So just want to again, open the floor up. Thank everybody for their time here this afternoon. But if anybody does have any last questions they'd like to get in, um, in any way, shape or form, happy to answer them. Um, but we do appreciate everybody joining us here today and we'll just give it another moment or two before anybody to, if you have any questions you want to just go ahead and unmute yourself, by all means, feel free to do that. Or if you want to put them in the chat box and our little, voice or camera shy, by all means, feel free to do that as well. I think they, someone had mentioned earlier, I don't know, are they able to mute, mute, unmute themselves? I think we have to unmute them for some reason. Yeah, they can unmute, you can unmute themselves. Okay. So um, I have a question regarding a uh, rent moratorium. Yep. If a lease is renewed during this time, are we allowed to increase the rent? Are you in Massachusetts or New Hampshire? I'm guessing Massachusetts. Mass Massachusetts. I believe, uh, is Fred still, Fred, can you, anyway, as, as the lawyer who was just speaking to that, do you want to speak to that if possible? Sure, sorry about that. Uh, I'm not aware of anything that would prevent you in either state of issuing a notice of, 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 of rent increase. Uh, if, if the lease has expired within the moratorium. Absolutely, that's the, absolutely. That's assuming, the assuming that the lease has happened. expired. I, I will say that it, it may not be a, a practical thing to do in, uh, in Massachusetts. I know that uh, one of the, uh, the ways that, that practitioners will, will sometimes uh, offer a rent increase is to do a notice to quit combined with an offer of a new tenancy at an, um, a, a higher rate. And I, I haven't done a lot, but once or twice I did it that way. Um, if I were to do it that way now, I'd be violating the Massachusetts uh, e e eviction moratorium. Uh, in New Hampshire, I think we have uh, done something, uh, in, in some of my cases, I've done something similar where we were having a problems with uh, tenants in different properties, and we sent out notices of non-renewal. Uh, I cautioned my clients that a notice of non-renewal really doesn't do anything to your um, to, to, to your tenant other than put him on notice that there could be consequences down the road to, to his behavior. Because even if you don't renew a lease, by operation of law, similar to, to uh, uh, Massachusetts and that, unless you do something else, uh, it, it very easily morphs into a, a, tenancy, at, uh, a tenancy at will. Uh, so uh, it, with uh, my New Hampshire cases, it's a little bit easier to predict when I'll be able to do certain things lawfully. Uh, in Massachusetts, uh, we're under this, this moratorium in the non-payment of rent uh, cases, 
where it uh, runs for uh, 120 days uh, plus something, or the state of emergency, uh, the end of the state of emergency plus something, and it's plus 45 in one scenario and plus 90 in another scenario. So it's really difficult to predict when uh, you can lawfully uh, do something under the, the, the Massachusetts moratorium. Uh, so I'm, I'm less comfortable uh, talking about um, what might be possible there. You, you have uh, mass lawyers as uh, other speakers that I've heard that uh, um, I would certainly recommend that, that uh, you listen to to address what, what might be possible um, in, the, uh, in the context of this, this, this crazy moratorium that we're, we're trying to navigate. So I think that answers the question. Again, the key part of that question is if it's a new lease, Again, if it's a new lease, it's open ball game. You can, do, you can do whatever you would like. If it's a current lease and you're trying to raise the rent, different story. Uh, David Flecker, I saw that you were raising your hand there. Uh, do you have something, a question you'd like to ask or anything you'd like to add? Just some input on what Fred was talking about. If your term lease has a rollover clause or a holdover clause in mass, then it turns to month to month. If there is no holdover or rollover, it is not a month to month, it ends. So the, the recommendation that my attorney has given me is if I have somebody coming up, don't try to raise the rent right now because of the notice that we have to give in mass because it is an actual notice to quit. And to just do a month to month lease with them if our leases do not have a holdover clause. And if you just have a traditional, your lease goes from June 1st to May 31st, you're good to go. If you have a clause in there that is a holdover clause, if you don't have it, it ends on that date. So it doesn't automatically roll to a month to month in Massachusetts. So they, so my attorney recommended that we do a month to month lease with them or rental agreement with them until that time, but do not try to raise rent. That, that, that makes a lot of sense to me, uh, given that uh, the, the, the usual way of, of raising rent would be uh, a, a notice to quit, which you can't do, in conjunction with an offer of, of, of a new tenancy. So yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me uh, what, what David's attorney is telling him. So um, another option could be don't ask, don't give them notice to quit but they could stay in the condo until the emergency is over. And they have an option of signing the lease with increased rent or they will leave when the emergency is over. Well, let's, let's back up a second. Let's have a clear understanding of what's happening here. When does their lease expire? Let's have uh, a- June 30th. So June 30th. Are they telling you that they're looking to leave now? Or are they- heard, No, I haven't heard anything from them yet. Okay. How does your how is your contract state that is a, is there a rollover clause that if they don't tell you anything it just basically extends? No, it says nothing. Just the lease expires on such and such date. On on I guess it would be May the or June thirty first. I think is right. what you said. June thirtieth. Yes. June thirtieth. Uh, Ron or Fred, you want to? I I would say in in that scenario, assuming that that the 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 tenant is willing to sign a new lease. Um, there's there's no legal impediment for you to uh, offer the new lease, and I, I could uh, I could see how uh, offering a new lease something that 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 uh, gives a tenant some security uh, you know, well into the future might appeal. Um, so that's uh, depending upon the the tenant's uh, situation. I can certainly see uh, a tenant wanting to commit to another year in a particular place, especially if uh, the, the, the rent increase is modest. Uh, we don't know, well, I certainly can't speak to what the market is going to be like um, mo months from, from now, and perhaps uh, your tenant would uh, uh, appreciate the security that knowing that your rent increase is something that he or she can afford and therefore would be inclined to sign on the dotted line 
uh, with a lease to commence after the expiration of the, the current lease uh, at uh, a new rent that's uh, acceptable uh, to, uh, to both of you. Thank you very much. It's very helpful. Does anybody else have any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Go ahead, Art. Uh, wouldn't, if your lease expires, wouldn't the tenant become a tenant at sufferance if there's no automatic rollover clause? No. As far as, as, far as my understanding, that would be a no. Red Not under the moratorium, Art. No. Yeah. But under normal, under normal circumstances. Yes. In normal, under normal circumstances, I believe that answer is yes. But in the, the confine, in the con, not the confines, the context at which we're talking um, about with the moratoriums on both the federal and the state level, no. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have any other questions? All right. Thank you so much, everybody. We promise to get you out of here in under 90 minutes. We thank you so much for taking some time out of your Monday to spend some time here with us. It does mean the world to us. Again, you have Black Diamond coming up next Monday, or next, not next Monday, next Tuesday, which is the 19th at 6 p.m. You can go to blackdiamondrei.com if you'd like to register for that. We will be with you two weeks from today on the 25th for another one of these live webinars. Uh, we'll have everybody on here then. Nick is going to do a presentation on kind of resurgence and how to kind of position yourself in 2020 and how to best position yourself moving forward from this. So we'd love to have you there for that as well. We will try to have some information for you uh, some point in time, if not later on this week, if not next week, on guidance that came out this week uh, to do a quick little Q&A video. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and all of our social media guidelines. Um, that we posted and you will of course have the uh, access to the PowerPoint slide today uh, to be sure that you can link with us there as well. Uh, make sure you're connecting with us again. We just want to give you guys the best information and the most information we possibly can to position this life the best way forward in the best position that we can for all of you folks as well. Nick, anything you'd like to add in? Uh, just, you know, thank you guys so much. Uh, it, like you see, yeah, Tuesday at 6.30, uh, register at blackdominaria.com. And then in two weeks from today, Anthony and Ron, we really appreciate you guys for your time. And uh, a new guest, Ken, who uh, took over uh, for Rich today on the Tenant Landlord. We appreciate you too. Uh, and if you will feel like you're to post your contact info in the uh, chat, if you'd like to, so people can reach out. But I uh, appreciate all of you guys very much, and we'll see you next Tuesday night. Bye, everybody. All right. Thank you.